Hi, Richard. <laughs> what a privilege. Uh, we, what a, pro what a, Thank what you. a privilege. Seriously, mutually so. And, and we're kind of, yeah. this is actually our first meeting as well. So that's kind of an interesting and exciting thing too. And okay. you asked me where I was. I did not ask you where you were, but I see kind of Maasai spears and all kinds of shields in the background, but I'm guessing you're not in Africa. Uh, no, I wish I was, but um, I'm actually in Minneapolis. I'm uh, outside of town about an hour on the St. Croix River, which is a national mm -hmm. wild and scenic river. It's right out my window here. Mm -hmm. So I look at Wisconsin across from the river below, but the shield and things, uh, you know, I've been leading walking safaris in Africa for 35 years. And I co-authored with my current author, uh, a bestseller called Repacking Your Bags, Lighten Your Load for the Rest of Your Life. And the opening story was about a Maasai elder. That's his father's spear from the 1800s and buffalo shield. And the other thing that's uh, over there is something that elders use when they sit under the tree. It's a wildebeest whisk that I was made an honorary well uh, elder over there a number of years ago. And so these are all things that really mean a lot to me. Mm. Um, they're not antiquities like in museums, but they mean a lot to me. So I'm in my office looking out at the river with that in the background. You, um, and, and Africa sort of features heavily in a lot of your storytelling and in a lot of your kind of prehistory. Yeah. How did walking about in Africa bring you to this theme? Um, around purpose, around eldering, around all of these, all of these different themes seem to have a root in Africa for you. Well, it wasn't the original root, but back in, um, let's see, I, I'm not sure of the exact date, but let's say 1980-ish, 83, I, uh, I was on the board of Outward Bound, the mm -hmm. board of trustees, and we went over to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,340 feet to raise money for Outward Bound, and after climbing the mountain to raise money, you know, if we make it, you get donations, et cetera. We went on a, a safari and somehow you've probably had that place and other people who are listening had that place where I stepped on the tarmac out of an airplane at Kilimanjaro airport and the smell and the feel, it just felt like home. And it wasn't some kind of woo-woo thing. Like it would just felt like, I don't know, I've been here or something about this place. And I found during the next three weeks that I was there doing this, that I just couldn't wait to come back. And the reason was not because of Kilimanjaro or the adventure, it was meeting the people and sitting around the fire, quite frankly, with elders from different uh, tribes. And one of those was the, the one who, whose shield and other things are in the background here. Yeah. Yeah, you wrote a book called Claiming Your Place in the Fire, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that was, uh, what, what was, what is that all about? Well, what it's about is that I observed one night, I would sit up late at night often because the, the sounds and I just didn't want to just miss it. And I was around, uh, and, but you'd sit around the fire during the day, I mean, during the evening, and the wisest of the elders sat the closest to the fire. Not the oldest of the elders, but the wisest of the elders. And I said, how do they know that? And they kind of looked at me like, well, they're the ones that hold the stories. They're the ones that we regard, you know, we don't have an oral history. These are, I'm talking now about hunter gatherers in particular. That story, that book is about sitting around with hunter gatherers. And I've been involved now, we created a foundation over there. I've, I've been involved with the last of the remaining hunter-gatherers now for about 20 some years. And they're called the Hadza, H-A-D-Z-A. And so um, that night after sitting with them, I said, well, where would my place be at the fire? Would I be closer, far away, or you know, at that kind of midlife age at, at, at the time? And um, so that became claiming your place at the fire, where will your place be, and what are the characteristics of that? So you've got a good memory. Mm, I've got good notes. <laughs> I took copious <laughs> notes. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so just, just, I just want to track back. Did you say that they said they, you don't know it, you feel it? it was, that, was that what you were saying? So do, and did you get clues as to how people feel when someone has wisdom? I'm sort of interested from an academy perspective. What, what are those kind of 
baseline characteristics of traits? Yeah. Well, the, uh, uh, first of all, with that tribe, the Hadza, who everybody, anthropologists and nutritionists and everybody is studying now because mm -hmm. they're called the original people, so to speak. So they're, they're um, all the time, they're in the New York Times or things like that, which is bef you know, befuddling them. But um, um, the, uh, they're a total sharing culture, Jeff. Everything is shared. I've never seen anything like this from day one. And it took me and my guide partners a number of years to get in there because they didn't, you know, to get to know them or to be with them and to walk and to do walkabout with them to begin with. And uh, everything is shared. I mean, 100%. And so when one of the elders, whose name is Kampala, uh, who had never been more never been to Kampala. That was, I don't know how he got the name, but uh, he'd never been more than like 50 kilometers from where we were sitting. Said to me, he said, Richard, you know, he's getting tired of my interview around claiming your place. And he said, do you know the two most important days in your life? And this has been attributed to lots of other people, but I said, yeah, birth and death. And he kind of looked at me like, well, you write these books and you came out here in this airplane and you're sitting there and you're in that tent. He said, no. I said, well, what are the two most important days? He said, birth, because of infant mortality. The second most important day in the life of a Hadza is when they determine how they're going to share, what they have, not just are they going to, but what are their gifts? What is it that they, and sometimes they wouldn't even name people until they knew what those gifts were. But uh, gifts meaning literally some are hunters, some are gatherers, some are, you know, other things. But can you imagine being in a culture where there are no leaders, no named leaders, no shamans, no uh, of those, and uh, totally egalitarian. If you're at a Hadza meeting, men and women, they're like, bah, 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 bah. and then they're, when they're done, they walk away totally on the same page mm. in, agree in agreement. I've never seen anything like it. So he said, you know, there's two most important days are when you determine, hey, I'm a Hadza, I'm going to share, and here's what I'm going to share. That's the second and so then, and again, that seems to tune into a bunch of your work around purpose, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the day you're born and the day you find your purpose, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in my uh, new book, the chapter that seems to get the, the most um, attention these days is the chapter called, uh, How Do I Stop Living a Default Life? Hmm. How do I, and so MEA is all about that. It's all about the great midlife edit you know, there's a story of Chip in the book and everything about the great midlife edit, et cetera. And, you know, I'm going to be coming down and teaching with him and um, uh, et, et cetera. But that whole business of the uh, oftentimes is when we visit that default life and say, well, what is the real sharing that I, or the real authentic life that I uh, can or want to live? You know, we have a lot of people come to the academy and purpose is a huge question. Yeah. Um, oftentimes people are at the beginning of a transition, um, yeah. maybe professional, maybe personal or whatever. And seeking purpose in a kind of an immediate society can be very frustrating for people, right? Yeah. Where there's that kind of immediacy of like, okay, I quit my job last week and I want to know what my purpose is this week. Tell us, Tell us what you've learned about finding those gifts and finding that purpose and, and, and what counsel you'd have for our community around how you might go about that effectively. Yeah. Well, now, how much time do we have? No, I'm just going to, I'm going to make it quick. But the, um, the, for, first of all, let me just say that, that purpose is not a luxury. Purpose is fundamental to, he to health, to healing, to happiness and fundamental to, to longevity. And it's now, you know, when I did a PBS special a few years ago and visited and compliments of PBS, I visited neuroscience labs around the country and saw that purpose in the brain and purpose in health are inextricably linked. If you don't have a sense of purpose, you don't, your telomeres don't grow. You know, it's a surprising science, but it's fundamental. You know, I, uh, I taught a program with Elizabeth Blackburn who, um, uh, won the Nobel Prize for the telomere effect. And part of the telomere effect, you know, those little shoelace-like things on the end of every chromosome in your body, 
if they shrink, you don't do well and you don't live as long. If they grow or stay healthy, you live longer and you're healthier. And, and purpose was a big part of the reason she won the Nobel Prize, the, the telium effect. So the point, Jeff, is simply that science and faith both agree that, that having a reason to get up in the morning is fundamental. It's not something that's just a luxury for a certain age, a certain stage, a certain uh, kind of person. Purpose is age agnostic. It's something that we're finding, even with this book on aging, that younger people are, are, are reading. So here's the uh, Rx, here's the prescription. So let's just say that, you know, purpose is too big to handle. So let me just give you a purpose. The purpose is only two words, grow and give. That's it. If you get up in the morning and you're going to grow and give today, and there are 1,440 purpose moments today, in a day, that's how many minutes are in a day, take sleep out of it, it'd be less, but um, so um, uh, uh, there's, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna grow and give? So I always say, look, you got a purpose now. Now write it on a post-it and put that purpose on your mirror. So tomorrow morning when you get, you know, when you get up, write grow and give on the post-it. Tomorrow morning when you get up, ask yourself how am I gonna grow and give today? And at the end of the day, before you go to bed, either with yourself or with a purpose partner, say, how did I grow and give to, uh, today? And after five days, you're going to have a felt sense of what this purpose thing really feels like, because it feels good. And it's not something that's that difficult. There's purpose with a big P and purpose with a little P. The big P purpose is like legacy. Oh, I got to have a calling. I've got to have a reason beyond, you know, save the world type of thing like um, uh, and purpose with a small p is is who you bring to life daily and when I learned this it's been repeated by other people over over time but uh, when I got out of counseling psychology graduate school Jeff trying to mm -hmm. figure out what to do with the rest of my life you know you think you'd kind of figure some of that out in counseling but it's always about somebody else and so I found that one of the people I studied and really esteemed was doing a seminar in San Diego. And his name was Victor Frankl. And who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, was in three concentration camps, and his whole family was exterminated. He was liberated, weighed 87 pounds, went back to Vienna where he was working with residents. Uh, I spent a week with him. And he mm. sent the last, in, in, and I was young, I was just out of graduate school, but I was like, you could hear a pin drop for five straight days as he, re and he, you know, basically he said the last of the human freedoms is choice. It's choose, it's saying yes to life in spite of the adversities that you're facing. And we all have adversities, he would say. He would, you know, he's, he got 30 honorary doctorates, his book sold millions of copies, et cetera. But his message was so eternally uh, believable by people. Um, and it still is today. And so that was a transformative moment for me to say, well, purpose, he got up, he didn't have purpose with a big P, he had purpose with a small P when he was, got up to give somebody else a kind word, a crust of bread, a slurp of soup, a hope. And we can do that today ourselves, but we need to have the mindset, the aim and the practice. So purpose is a verb. It's something we do. It's not something that we just have in our brain or on the wall. So I can go off in a lot of different directions, but the point is, I think that all of us, including you, and my question is, when you've had what I call fortuitous encounters with people, I think they have them at, at MEA. I mean, that's a place to have to, to hopefully have them, but I have, I've had many. I've, I met with Abraham Maslow, et cetera, along the way. I've had, you know, very wise they're not mentors, but they're fortuitous encounters that are game changers that then help us look at big P, little p purpose. And so anyway, I thought that's a practice that I would hope people would try that I just meant to put the post-it on the mirror. So, And, and you, you pointed something really interesting and, and I think important, um, Richard, and help me tease this apart. Do you do you need to have different types of purposes to lead, to kind of get that full purpose pill benefit, right? That full like seven years of extension of life and all of those benefits you talk about. 
And what I'm thinking of is perhaps you're a caregiver, um, either to children or to aging parents, and that is a very meaningful purpose, right? Do you need to have something outside of that? Or perhaps you're you know, running a fantastically successful business and that gives you a daily purpose. Do you need to have a more personal purpose? Do, do you see where I'm going? Do you need do these I think purposes so. overlap? Uh, but I think, I'm not sure, but th let's make a distinction between a goal and a purpose. Mm. Because a goal can be to be a good caregiver or to do the business, but purpose is something that you has does. It's an aim without. It's like going west. It doesn't have a necessarily an ending. It's who you bring, and the one thing that's universal about purpose is it's always beyond yourself. It's always about who you bring to others and um, that 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 community. I know in 1973 back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, I was, uh, I, I got a fellowship to, uh, um, it's called a Bush Fellowship, which is Archibald Bush, the founder of, of 3M Company. And I apprenticed myself because there wasn't actually an academic program. I apprenticed myself to the Harvard Study of Adult Development, which is the longest standing study of adults in the, in the world and still housed in the Harvard Business School for whatever reasons. And, and uh, but you know, when you look at the essentials to a long, fulfilling life, it basically gets down to a couple of things, to belong and to matter. That's it. I mean, you can look at all the other factors, but uh, I know, uh, Jeff, one of my colleagues on his voicemail, his answering machine, when you call him, he says, at the sound of the tone, leave your answer to life's two eternal questions. Who are you and what do you want? And I think that's kind of the, uh, the bottom line. <laughs> Who are you and what do you want? And that can change, as you point out, at diff with different circumstances and different stages of life. But who you bring, the, uh, the answer to who are you and what do you want gets down to two things, to belong and to matter. Oof. And people we want to belong, feel part of tribe or community. And, and both faith and science both agree on this, that isolation is fatal. Isolation is an incredibly bad thing for people. And so I think one of the reasons I love MEA among many I could list is, is this whole sense of what we're doing this minute with a community of other people who are hungry for not going it alone. Yeah. The, the Harvard study was famously sort of mostly men mostly white men for a large part of it, yes. of it sort of genesis. For the, or the original years, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as, as women were sort of recognized by institutions of, like Harvard that they existed, um, did, did that change? So as, as, as women kind of came into the equation, yeah. and, I, and I'm being a little yeah. bit facetious, did, did the yeah. research change? Did, did some of the findings change? Yeah. Yeah, with different leaders over time. I mean, it was it used to be called the Grant Study, and it was uh, funded by W. T. Grant of departments or you know, department store fame back then, to find out how to make better leaders. And uh, then it evolved and has continued. Robert Waldinger, who is a Buddhist uh, monk and a, a psychiatrist and a Harvard researcher, heads the study up now. He's way broadening it out, and yeah. uh, uh, which is. It, and it's been broadened out before him with others uh, like George Villant. And so the answer is, you know, it's limited. It's not, but it's, you know, it has tracked over time. It's worth looking at. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm not discounting yeah. that. I'm just, yeah. I was wondering is, as it's broadened, have there been any surprising findings? Has anything else been added to this sort of canon of knowledge? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd have to go and sort of look at yeah. slice and dice a few things. But I think the whole business of that I, I mentioned before, that isolation is fatal, that increasingly what they're finding is that people do not have somebody to talk to. It's more prevalent among men than women, but it's increased radically with women as well. And it's not just pandemic. People are alone and the loneliness epidemic is huge. Yeah. And they're, they're seeing that now. Uh, over time, it was less evident. Now it's way more evident. 
have a I have a couple of questions about your current book about what you're yeah. what you're doing right now so you've just released a book and I was really fascinated by the title um who, who do you want to be when when you grow old yeah. um as kids were asked what do you want to be when you grow old and I and I thought that that was just a really beautiful distinction can yeah, you yeah. can you talk to us around that no, we we that's exactly what we riffed on with that with this this book. It, it the when you're growing up, and I ask this to your to the people online here. Did anyone ever ask you what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm. So most people say yeah they and you know I wanted to be an astronaut or I wanted to be a teacher or, you know. So we looked at now that you're growing up we substituted what with who, who do you want to be when you grow old? And the publisher said, you know, old is not a good word in, in uh, publishing. And I said, we said, great, we're using it because we want to own old as good. We want to be anti pro at pro age, not anti age. So, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then the subtitle is the path of purposeful aging. So what we wanted to say is that, that, um, uh, aging isn't optional. Growing is. So growing old is different than getting old. And so, you know, 47 years ago, there was a book that came out that a lot of people will recognize called Passages. And Passages was based on the Harvard study and a couple other studies, but mostly the Harvard study. And that book, Passages, was on was really about defining a new narrative for midlife. And it was on the New York Times bestseller list for like four or five years. Maybe still is for all I know. But anyway, the, um, and Gail Sheehy, uh, who's a journalist, wrote it at the time reporting. Yep. And that new language and that new narrative ended though in midlife. And so what we wanted to do, like MEA wants to do, I believe, I'm just projecting now, is to create the new narrative of the shift, you know, there's two shifts, the big shift from youth to adulthood, but the next shift is from adulthood to elderhood. And so that shift needed a new narrative or needs a new narrative, not that we've, and so what we found and what I found so far is that this book is providing a new narrative. It's short with stories and uh, uh, theme themes in it, but it's a new narrative and a new language for this shift from uh, like MEA stands for, and that's why we're on this call. <laughs> I, have a, I have a total pivot and it, just a total swerve. Um, and this just fascinates me. So looking through your book list, you've written many books in partnership. We were talking about Alan Weber, um, who's yeah. a, a dear friend of the Academy. Um, yeah. his, his daughter Amanda is, is um, girlfriend to our own Teddy Dean, our yoga teacher and Dharma teacher. Yeah. Um, but many books you've written with David Shapiro. And I'm, I'm interested in your partnership. I'm interested in your creative process. I know a lot of people in our community are interested in writing. Yeah. Talk to me about you and David. How do you know each other? How do you work together? How did you arrive at this sort of common <laughs> purpose? <laughs> Well, I did a seminar for a company that he was working for and uh, on becoming a more purpose purposefully engaged employee. And he, he took it seriously and left, quit. And so, and went to Paris to study or to write on the, on the and at, this is way, way back when, and we kept in touch. And after that, he came back to the US after a year and we stayed in touch and we ended up writing Repacking Your Bags, which became a million seller in 21 languages and we wow. continued. And he's a philosopher, he's a philosophy professor. And Jeff, he used to write stand-up comedy for Bob Hope in Los Angeles. <laughs> and he himself is a hysterical, and he's a yogi, he's a Ashtanga, uh, he's he had two uh, Fulbrights in India, but he's a tenured philosophy professor and teaches philosophy for children as well as philosophers for college students. So, so we've maintained this conversation in writing these books together over time. And so the opening chapter in this book is called The Long Conversation. 
-hmm. And it talks about the conversation we had and that we, and now he's, I'm 77, he's 63. And the conversation Mm -hmm. we've had over these years and we're still having today and about this, and we were at a baseball game. It starts out and the game was rained out. So we were sitting there having a beer, talking and saying, well, well, let's, let's, let's write about what we're talking about. So it kind of started there, but, but our writing practice is, you know, people always say, I want to write a book. I said, what is your practice? And they look at me like I'm from outer space. And I said, well, if you don't have a practice, you're going to be a waiter, not a writer. And so uh, <laughs> my, our practice was that I do a lot of, I, I write by hand and I would scan and send it to him. He would react, he'd send it back. And um, I did a lot of the interviews for the book because a lot of the people like Chip that I had relationships with that I could talk, talk with. But the, the actual writing of the book took, let's see, about eight months, but it was a long conversation before that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but the the relationship is we would be back and forth and back and forth and trying to make it as simple as possible. This book is hardcover. Leslie, hold that up again, please. Um, sorry, but it's 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 a five by seven hardcover, beautifully designed. I mean, I have to say, aesthetically beautifully designed book, and the stories in it are really, really wonderful stories. I mean, like. Uh, they're they're real real people and live in real lives but it's short and at the end the final answer to your to my riff on your question is that it starts out with the first chapter the long conversation the last chapter is the ultimate conversation and it's about dying Mm. and we talk about what are the things that we you know how do we want to die where do we want to die what do we want to live we actually had that conversation and then we said well we can't ask anyone else to do this unless we talk about it ourselves. Let's print it. And I've had so many people say, oh my God, I can't believe that you wrote about how you want to die and where you want to die. And I went, well, it makes me more alive, makes me more today know how precious life is and how precious and what is what, what I need to say no to. And, you know, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> So I can say no to things today and not mean it in a toxic or a mean way, but just say, no, I'm not, that's, you know, I'm, this is what I'm about. <laughs> and I think that's, no is a big thing at midlife. I listened to a recording of you, and it may have been a couple of years back, um, where you basically said that your purpose is to help other people find their purpose. Is that still the case or is that evolved? My big P purpose is to help others unlock the power of purpose. So that's kind of like what I really am all about. My little P purpose is to make it practical on a day-to-day basis for people Mm. and to make it practical in my own life. What I want to do on a day-to-day basis, I wrote in that last chapter. And that that is, uh, I want, uh, what it's all about for me is to make a difference in one person's life every day. That's, That's as good as it gets. I mean, as purposeful as it gets, I should say. You are living proof that having a purpose is, is <laughs> enlivening. You are completely electric, my friend. It is, it is <laughs> such a pleasure to talk to you. Right, um, thank you. Yeah, right. I'm going to open it up to our, our community for discussion and chat. And uh, there have been a ton of questions running through the chat. Um, Leslie, do you want to sort of cherry pick a couple of people just to come up and, yes. and sort of share with us? Absolutely. Um, Gary Musiak, if you can unmute yourself and anybody else that has a question, you can uh, t- click the reactions button and just raise your hand on Zoom yeah. and we'll uh, we'll take questions that way. It's easier than running through the through the chat. Leslie, did you mean me? I'm not sure. Um, not Gary Ganya. I, I, OK, so Gary Musiak said, how do you create a sense of belonging during this time of a pandemic and social mm. isolation? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Oh, it's music. Thank you. I just didn't see you. Um, go ahead. Uh, the um, that's a great question, and I don't have a silver bullet answer other than this. I think that um, particularly at midlife, you need a sounding board, and a sounding board has several characters on it. And um, then you can, re- and the number one person is a committed listener. 
someone who really gets you. You can talk transparently with that person and without them fixing you, they practice care versus cure. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not fixing you, they're listening to you and, and um, you can have that. And that's difficult, uh, more difficult with Zoom, but in some ways and easier in other ways because you, you don't have to travel and do those kinds of things. And uh, secondly, uh, on the sounding board is a wise elder. Who are the people that help you see the big picture? and know what weight to give things. Who's 10 years ahead of you that you say, you know, Jeff and Chip and what is that? You know, they may not be 10 years ahead, but they're, you know, they're people who can hold up the mirror. Third is who is a wise younger? Somebody who asks the questions that are like, oh, not, I'm not talking about technology and things like that, but they, they're, they're in, the, in it with you. And the fourth is a uh, purpose partner. And I'll tell you, a lot of people said, you know who my purpose partner is? My dog or my cat, because I can talk with, with them and et cetera. But literally, I don't mean that, although that's not a bad idea. But a purpose partner is somebody who says, you know, that, that little mirror test I gave, uh, they can say, um, Jeff, did you do the five? Did you do this for five days? And how did it result? So they kind of hold you accountable because they love you, not because they're trying to punish you, but they want you to get what you want, what you say you want. And so I'm, uh, I would not, over years of coaching, uh, I would not coach anybody unless they had a sounding board. That's how important I thought it was. And I think midlife is a perfect time to create uh, that kind of a, and, you know, oftentimes we can have, and I think this is part of the magic of MEA, although I haven't been there, but I've taught at many retreat centers, and is to meet a stranger who you can talk with that is the first time you've had this conversation with no assessments, nobody saying, oh yeah, but Jeff, you know, what about this? And what about the money? Or what about, you know, the, and so you can have that and, and use it literally as a, as a sounding board. So I think during the pandemic, what I found is that isolation has been a big deal and, and the epidemic of loneliness we, we, met, we mentioned earlier, but I think uh, a sounding board is one solution. Thank you, Rich. Just to, before we go, Gary, sorry, did you have anything else to say? No, no, I'm good. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I just want to build on this. Um, you, you raised something, Richard, that, that is sort of very present in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, we think a lot of these tools are self-help tools, right? It's like, how do I help myself to find my purpose, to lead a richer and, lead a richer and fuller life or, or whatever yeah. it might be? Yeah. How do you use these tools to help someone else in your life if you are that person that sat close to the fire and you see that someone has drifted from their purpose or or has yeah. sort of disconnected from that part of themselves yeah. how can you help them without being the i love your care versus cure dichotomy how can you in a caring way help them back or help yeah. them guide yeah. them back to that yeah that's a eternal question Question. Carl Jung said the greatest damage you can do to others, particularly kids, is your own unlived life. So the starting point is to be your message, so to speak, as many people have said in, in, uh, in various ways, to be purposeful in your own way. And purpose is always about uh, compassion is the soul of purpose. And compassion means to, to add value to, to other lives. My favorite purpose quote, which is kind of to your question, is by E.B. White, who said, I arise in the morning torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, I think it's about both saving and savoring, not literally saving, but savoring. But saving means making some sort of small contribution that day. People like Frankel and even, you know, uh, um, Maslow, I mean, many people teach the Maslow hierarchy, right? But the year before I met Maslow when he was 69, the year before he died, and uh, he and Frankel had an adversarial relationship. And because Frankel said self-actualization, oh, that's about self-help, like you're, you're talking about. So it's about self. And Frankel would say, well, isn't it really about self-transcendence? And just before he died, he, uh, Maslow agreed. It's about, there's another top to the pyramid. It's called self-transcendence. 
And his wife, whose name I can't remember right now, I think it's Anna, um, wrote a book called The Farther Reaches of Human Nature, which said ultimately that he and Frankel agreed that the top is self-transcendence. So I think the point is that it is about self-transcendence, but not in a way that you don't savor or you give away. You don't have to be Mother Teresa. You don't have to be save the save the planet, but but you are part of you know faith and science agree that 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 you're part of community and you're part of uh, and being part of community is healthier. I'd like seven questions. I'm sort of question oh. greedy right now, so I'm going <laughs> to let Annie, who's actually who's actually raised her hand. I could talk morning. to you for the rest of the day. I'll tell you that, <laughs> Annie. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Actually, Gary Ganyo was first, and then Annie. Can we do I'm that? I'm sorry. So, so, hey, thank Gary you. first and then Annie. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is really wonderful, really, really, really powerful. Um, uh, an observation and a question to follow on that. A lot of what I'm hearing leads me to um, understand that, you know, a couple of the barriers that seem to be in our way in relative to purpose are around um, kind of our, our cultural tendency to kind of really create self-centered human beings, um, all of which were, I feel stuck in that. Um, yeah. And um, and an invitation to honesty. You know, it's hard to be honest. It's hard to really say kind of, you know, what you really want, you know, who you really are, what you want to be. So I'm curious around, you know, some of your studies, especially cross-culturally, you know, um, yeah. how to help us kind of be less self-centered and and more honest. Wow. I mean, if I could be useful there, I'd do anything I could. But I, I go back, Gary, to grow and give. You know, it, it, the grow could be seen as self-absorbed or it could be about narcissism or about what you say. But if you don't grow, you don't have enough to give. You don't have the awareness or the... the uh, and so um, my, my purpose... Uh, formula that I've worked on for now decades is three letters, G plus P plus V equals C. Gifts plus passions plus values equals calling. And calling is another term, a vocational term for purpose. And so are you using your gifts on things that you feel purposeful or passionate about in environments where you have a voice or values that fit. And that's pretty much the, the science behind that is solid. And but I've been teaching this for a, for a long, long time. And I call it the napkin test. And I call it a lot of other things if you because people say to me kiddingly, but not so kiddingly after the PBS special people said, like on an airplane, got a minute. I call it the got a minute school of coaching. Got a minute. Can you tell me what I should do with the rest of my life? And I went, because I saw you on PBS, but you know, I only got a minute and then we're off. So I said, well, write this on a napkin, G plus P plus V. So the starting point is to do some self-awareness here uh, in order to know what you have to give and what you want to give to. So with the G, it's how do you want to help? With the P, passions, it's who do you want to help? And with the V values is where do you want to help? And so, you know, it takes a little bit. And I think that's what MEA is all about. Whether they use a formula like this, et cetera, it's helping people to push the pause button to step back and particularly these gifts. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, my career chose me. I didn't choose it. I got to a certain point where, you know, I did it because I lived a default life. You know, this is what was available to me and where it was available to me at the time, et cetera. And, but now that I'm 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever I am, do I have to keep living a default life? What are, what are my options? And so uh, you can't look in the rearview mirror. You can look in the rearview mirror and get some insights, but the windshield's way bigger than the rearview mirror. So when you start looking at the windshield, then how do you discern, define, sort of narrow, well, this is one way to do it, gifts, passions, and values. So I don't know, Gary, if that helps, but that's that's my long-winded answer. Yeah, no, it it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's super rich. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, now. Annie. 
Oh. Annie, I'm sorry. Oh, follow that pearl. Oh, phenomenal. I love it. So um, I came to MEA with my growth partner. That's what we decided we call each other. Other people yeah. saw us as a couple. That wasn't the truth. The truth of our purpose was yeah. to encourage each other to always grow. And it comes in the form of a daily phone call. Mm, and it's yeah. hinged on Mark Nepo's book, The Book of Awakening. Mm. And we read to each other every day, but usually we capsulize what's happened that day and what was significant. And then we'll read and the reading then is perfectly in alignment with what we had just gone through. Yeah. So everything that you are saying, Richard, I have to tell you is so affirming I feel like I have both oars in the water and that I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to encourage you all. I'm at my mid seventies now. And I got to tell you, I never felt younger and more purposeful. And at this point, so <laughs> you the can rest tell. of you. I, I, feel, I feel it when I listen to you. And but purpose, so Annie, is, I love your practice. That's brilliant. Uh, my question would be, um, purpose is a verb. And so okay. do, do, you, do you activate and for the sake of others, something as a result of that conversation you have with your growth partner? Okay, I'm an executive coach in the humanitarian realm. So that's my work world. Oh, okay, all right. But by the same token, I do exactly what you do. I really wait for the universe to show me where I need to make a difference each day. Yeah. And if I can make a difference in one person's life, be yeah. it at the grocery store, be it on the phone, be wherever, I'm lit from within yeah. and I know they are too. And I yeah. love, I used to love flying Southwest to see who <laughs> would be seated next to me. It was always an adventure. I know yeah. you got it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. So affirming. I just want yeah. to- By the way, how... uh, the late Barbara Marks Hubbard oh, in, her in, her, yes. in, her, in her 90s coined the term vocational arousal. Ooh, okay. And so I think mid midlife vocational arousal is that sense that you're getting from with your growth partner. It's arousal, yeah. meaning you said we're not partners, and but it's an arousal that, that has emotional engagement. And I love that. I love hearing you talk about that. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> and on to Nick. Leslie, I think we'll have one more question after Nick's. And if no one's got one, I definitely do. <laughs> okay. Hey. So Richard, I'm, um, I'm 57 and I'm just creating a new business. Yeah. I create for a living. Um, I've always invented products, board games, just, um, it's what I do. And I, I just got your, I just, I hadn't, I've been researching decks for a long time. Yeah. I'd missed your deck and I got to call, tell you. Calling cards. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's really, really cool. Like I've got all yeah. the other, I've got every single values and, mm -hmm. um, no. Spence deck that exists in the market and i love the fact you you basically added opinion to this with your realistic artistic structured yeah. enterprise yeah. It, it's so cool it's this is the so secret sauce i'm bringing to mea by the way when i come right. to baja well so. I, the one, <laughs> this uh, this thing is i i use it everywhere in the world so right. go ahead nick i'm sorry yeah. so uh, i have a question do yeah. you own the do you own the rights to the deck yeah I could, if you're interested in talking, because I'm basically building a, a, a platform to digitize card decks, and I would love your content because it's just, it's my favorite values yeah. uh, and creativity yeah. deck. But yeah. I don't want to dominate yeah. now, but I would love yeah. to connect. Yeah, and, uh, yeah no, the, the, and uh, if you go on my website, richardleiter.com, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff about the calling cards and, and uh, some downloadable, right. not when you don't even have the deck. So you feel free to with you know at, at, attrib attribution to use it so that link okay. is in the chat i just put it in there uh, okay yes laurie 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 um you had a call a uh, question in the chat do you want to do you want to surface that or should we roll on laurie um, uh, yeah hi. <laughs> hi thanks yeah i was just wondering if you could differentiate um the the sounding board versus a purpose partner and especially kind of from a coaching perspective um well i said a purpose partner is somebody who's on a sounding board 
Um, I, I think having just one person is better than not having one person, but I think having a variety of, of uh, inputs, that's why you have more people on a board, or, you know, a fiduciary board than not. So getting some, some differing points of view, and uh, I think that's, MEA is brilliant at that, is, is uh, you know, having different points of view in the room and different ethnicities and different genders and different uh, faiths, et cetera. So, um, but a purpose partner is more like, like a, I suppose, like a coach, like a personal trainer who, who's, who's a friend or a colleague, but is willing to hold you um, like, well, like Annie, the, you, you know, you hold each other accountable. You don't let each other off the hook. You said you didn't do your, your gig this day. That's not acceptable to me. Okay, thank you. One last question, and then we will let you go because I'm already four minutes <laughs> over what I promised you this would be. I'm, I'm fine. You do whatever you need to do here. I'm good. Um, we started talking um, about your travels in Africa yeah. and Outward Bound. Um, yeah. What is the role of travel, both for you and more broadly for people as they're trying to find new purpose, new community, new identity? This is something we're interested in at the Academy and I'd love to know what you've learned about it. Well, I'll send you a piece I wrote called Traveling on Purpose. Mm. Um, that, Please do. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it, I think it, if you allow it, um, it's different now with COVID, et cetera, but it, it certainly opens up whole new uh, vistas. I mean, I use Africa all the time, not just because to romanticize adventure, because my trips are called InVenture. My company is called InVenture, like adventure, but in the purpose company. The trips that I, I lead are called InVenture Expeditions. And the subtitle, Jeff, you'll love, is called Back to the Rhythm. So what I look for is a way to get back to the rhythm, back to the mm. core. So when we're in Africa, for example, and Africa is just one example. I've, I've, I'm a three million mile flyer on Delta and I haven't been in an airport for 16 months, which is kind of, I'm yearning. Can you believe it? I'm yearning to go back to an airport. <laughs> And I, I just haven't, and I haven't needed to, but now I'm starting to uh, uh, again. But back to the rhythm, you know, I have a watch on, let's put our watches away. Let's go to bed when we're tired and get up when we're awake and let's listen to it. And let's take a solo every single day of alone time to check in with yourself. And when we walk, we walk in silence. So a lot of different slices. I mean, that's, I'm giving you a very personal example of an inventure expedition, but what it allows people to say, it, it took them three days after getting to Africa to get back to the rhythm. Three days. People said, you know, at, you know it's five o'clock. When do we eat? Uh, what are we doing tomorrow? What's the schedule? You know, and I said, relax, man, breathe. We're, we're going to take it, take it easy here and let things, let time happen. And, uh, and people say, you know, I was so busy and so wedded to my technology, totally out of touch with myself. Oh my God, I can't believe how much fun this is to not have to do an email or not have to look at my watch or, you know, do and, and really smell and feel things. Well, I think that's not always available with travel, but that's what I try to make available to travel. So I'll send you an article I wrote about that uh, and see if it, if it has any resonance. I would love that and we'll share it with everyone if that's okay. Yeah. Sure, of course, yeah. Okay, <laughs> Richard, wow, thank you so much. You truly are wonderful and I'm so <laughs> excited to have you come and join us. And Leslie, it's next, it's November, not ne not this year, but next year, correct? Yeah. Yes, November 14th to the 19th of 22. Richard mm -hmm. and I will be back for a That month. was only because it was a scheduling thing on my pro my fault. It was, I mean, I would want to come earlier, but it just didn't work. So anyway, it's all with good. Yours, <laughs> it's all well, good. We, yeah. we also have a special workshop with you, Richard, for the Corazon alumni next week, the 24th. Um, yeah, I'm looking so forward to that. Yeah. I am too. Yeah. More of you. We could have gone on for a few more hours here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. No, I was really looking forward to this as I am to the next two events as well. So thank you for the privilege of your time because time is always 
it's a big deal to people and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Me too. Thank, thank you. you. And thank everybody for coming today. I'm gonna move these spotlights and put yourself in gallery view, take yourself off of mute and say goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you. Bye.